Chapter 1 of Leonora. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Leonora by Arnold Bennett. Chapter 1. A household at Hillport. She was walking, with her customary air of haughty and rapt leisure, across the marketplace of Bursley, and she observed in front of her, at the top of Old Castle Street, two men conversing and gesticulating vehemently, each seated alone in a dog cart. These persons, who had met from opposite directions, were her husband, John Stanway, the earthenware manufacturer, and David Dane, the solicitor who practised at Hambridge. Stanway's cob, always quicker to start than to stop, had been pulled up with difficulty, drawing his cart just clear of the other one, so that the two portly and middle-aged talkers were most uncomfortably obliged to twist their necks in order to see one another. The attitude did nothing to ease the obvious asperity of the discussion. She thought the spectacle undignified and silly, and she marvelled, as all women marvel, at men who conduct themselves so magisterially should sometimes appear so infantile. She felt glad that it was Thursday afternoon, and the shops closed, and the streets empty. Immediately John Stanway caught sight of her. He said a few words to the lawyer in a somewhat different key, and descended from his vehicle. As she came up to them, Mr Dane saluted her with bashful abruptness, and her proud face broke as if by the loosing of a spell into a generous and captivating smile. Mr Dane blushed. The vision was too much for his composure. He moved his horse forward a yard or two, and then jerked it back again, gruffly advising it to stand still. Stanway turned to her bluntly, unceremoniously, as to a creature who, to whom he owed nothing. She noticed once more how the whole character of his face was changed under annoyance. Leonora, he said, speaking with the raw anger of a man with a newborn grievance, come this home for me. I'm going over to Hambridge with Mr. Dane. Very well, she agreed with soothing calmness and, taking the reins, she climbed up to the high driving seat. But I say, Nora, more back, he flamed out passionately to the impatient cob. Where your manners, you idiot? I say, Nora, I doubt I shall be late for tea, half past six. Tell Milly she must be in, the others too. He gave these instructions in a lower tone, and emphasised them by a stormy and ominous frown. Then, with an injured, Now, Dane, he got into the equipage of his legal adviser, and departed towards Hambridge, trailing cloud of vexation. Leonora drove smartly but cautiously down the steep slope of Oakcastle Street. She could drive as well as a woman may. A group of clay-soiled girls lounging in the archway of a manufactory exchanged rude but admiring remarks about her as she passed. The faces of the cob, the dazzle of the silver-plated harness, the fine lines of the carts, the unbending mien of the driver, it a glittering sinusure for envy. All around was grime, squalor, servitude, ugliness. Inglorious travail of two hundred thousand people, above ground and below it, filled the day and the night. But here, as it were, suddenly, out of that earthy and laborious bed, rose the blossom of luxury, grace and leisure, the final elegance of the industrial district of the five towns. The contrast between Leonora and the rough creatures in the archway, between the flower and the phosphates which nourished it, was sharp and decisive. And Leonora, in the September sunshine, was well aware of the contrast. She felt that the loud-voiced girls were at one extremity of the scale, and she at the other. This arrangement seemed natural, necessary, inevitable. She was a beautiful woman. She had a slim, perfect figure, Quite simply, she carried her head so high and her shoulders so square that her back seemed to, to be hollowed out, and no tightness on the part of her bodice could hide this charming concavity. Her face was handsome with its large, regular features. One noticed the abundant black hair under the hat, the thick eyebrows, the brown and opaque skin, the teeth impeccably white, and the firm, unyielding mouth and chin. Underneath the chin, Half muffling it, came a white muslin bow, soft, frail, feminine, an enchanting disclaimer of that facial sternness 
and the masculinity of that tailor-made dress, a single at once provocative and wistful of the woman. She had brains. They appeared in her keen, dark eyes. Her judgment was experienced and mature. She knew her world and its men and women. She was not too soon shocked, not too severe in her verdicts, not the victim of too many illusions. And yet, everything about her witnessed to a serene temperament and the continual appeasing of mild desires, she dreamed, sadly, like the girls in the archway, of an existence more distinguished than her own, an existence brilliant and tender, a dalliance and high endeavour, virtue and the flavour of sin, eternal appetite and eternal satisfaction, were incredibly united. Even now, on her fortieth birthday, she still believed in the possibility of a conscious state of positive and continued happiness, and regretted that she should have missed it. The imminence and the arrival of this dire birthday, this day of wrath on which the proudest woman will kneel to implacable destiny and beg a reprieve, induced the reveries natural to it, the self-searching, the exchange of old fallacies for new, the dismayed glance forward, the lingering look behind. Absorbed though she was in the control of the sensitive steed, the field of her mind's eye seemed to be entirely filled by an image of the woman of forty as imagined by herself at the age of twenty. And she was that woman now. She did not feel like forty. At thirty she had not felt thirty. She could only accept the almanac and the rules of arithmetic. The interminable years of her marriage rolled back, and she was eighteen again, ingenuous and trustful, convinced that her versatile husband was unique among his sex. The fading of a short-lived and factitious passion, the descent of the unique male to the ordinary level of males, the births of her three girls and their rearing and training, all these things seemed as trifles to her, mere excrescences and depressions in the vast tableland of her monotonous and placid career. She'd had no career. Her strength of will, courage, of love, had never been taxed, only her patience. My life is over, she told herself, insisting that her life was over without being able to believe it. As the dog cart was crossing the railway bridge at Shawport, at the foot of the rise to Hillport, Donna Nora overtook her eldest daughter. She drew up. From the height of the dog cart she looked at her child and the girlishness of Ethel's form, the self-consciousness of newly arrived womanhood in her innocent and timid eyes, the virgin richness of her vitality, made Leonora feel sad, superior, and protective. "'Your mother? Where's father?' Ethel exclaimed, staring at her, struck with a foolish wonder to see her mother where her father had been an hour before. "'A oh, schoolgirl she is. At her age I was a mother twice over,' thought Leonora. She said aloud, Come back quickly, my dear. You know Prince won't stand. Ethel obeyed awkwardly. As she did so, the mother scrutinised the rather lanky figure, the long, dark skirt, the pale blouse and the straw hat, in a single glance that missed no detail. Leonora was not quite dissatisfied. Ethel carried herself tolerably. She resembled her mother. She had more distinction than her sisters, but her manner was often lackadaisical. Her father was very vexed about something, said Leonora, when she had recounted the meeting at the top of Old Castle Street. Where's Minnie? I don't know, Mother. I think she went out for a walk. The girl added apprehensively. Why? Oh, nothing, said Leonora, pretending not to observe that Ethel had blushed. If I were you, Ethel, I should let that belt out one hole. Not here, my dear child, not here. Can you get home? How was Aunt Hannah? Every day, one member or another of John Stanway's family had to pay a visit to John's venerable Aunt Hannah, who lived with her brother, the equally venerable Uncle Meshach, in a little house near the parish church of St Luke's. This was a social rite, the admission of which nothing could excuse. On that day, it was Ethel who had called. Auntie was all right. She's making a lot of parking, and of course I had to taste it all new, you know. I'm simply stodged. Don't say stodged. Oh, mother, you won't let her say anything, Ethel dismally protested, it, and Leonora secretly sympathised with the grown woman in revolt. 
Oh, and Aunt Hannah wishes you many happy returns. Uncle Bishak came back from the Isle of Man last night. He gave me a note for you. Here it is. I can't take it now, dear dear. Give it to me afterwards. I think Uncle Meshach's a horrid old thing, said Ethel. My dear girl, why? Oh, I do. I'm glad he's only father's uncle and not ours. And you hate that name. Fancy being called Meshach. That isn't uncle's fault, anyhow, said Leonora. You always stick up for him, mother. I believe it's because he flatters you and says you look younger than any of us. Ethel's tone was half roguish, half resentful. Leonora gave a short, unsteady laugh. She knew well that her age was plainly written beneath her eyes, at the corners of her mouth, under her chin, at the roots of the hair above her ears, and in her cold, confident gaze. Youth. She would have forfeited all her experience, her knowledge, and the charm of her maturity to recover the irrecoverable. She envied the woman by her side, and envied her because she was lightsome, thoughtless, kittenish, simple, unripe. For a brief moment, vainly coveting the ineffable charm of Ethel's immaturity, she had a sharp perception of the obscure mutual antipathy which separates one generation from the next. As the cob rattled into Hillport, that aristocratic and plutocratic suburb over the town, that haunt of exclusiveness, that retreat of high life and good tone, she thought how commonplace, vulgar and petty was the opulent existence within those tree-shaded villas, and that she was doomed to droop and die there. For her girls, still unfledged, might, if they had the sense to use their wings, fly away. At the same time it gratified her to reflect that she and hers were in the picture and conformed to the standards. She enjoyed the admiration which the sight of herself and Ethel and the expensive cob and cart and accoutrements must arouse in the punctilious and stupid breast of Hillport. She was picking flowers from the table from the vivid borders of the lawn, when Ethel ran into the garden from the drawing room. Anne, the St Bernard, was loose and investigating the turf. Mother, a letter from Uncle Meshach. Leonora took the soiled envelope and, handing over the flowers to Ethel, crossed the lawn and sat down on the rustic seat facing the house. The dog followed her and, with his great paw, demanded her attention, but she abruptly dismissed him. She thought it curiously characteristic of Uncle Meshach that he should write her a letter on her fortieth birthday. You could imagine the uncouth mixture of wit, rude candour and wisdom with which he would greet her. His was a strange and sinister personality, but she knew that he admired her. The note was written in Meshach's scraggly and irregular hand, in three lines starting close to the top of a half a sheet of notepaper. It ran, Dear Laura, I hear young Twemlow is come back from America. You'd better see as your John looks out for himself. There was nothing else, no signature. As she read it, she experienced precisely the physical discomfort which those feel who travel for the first time in a descending lift. Fifteen quiet years had elapsed since the death of her husband's partner, William Twemlow, and a quarter of a century since William's wild son, Arthur, had run away to America. Yet Uncle Meshach's letter seemed to invest these far-off things with a mysterious and disconcerting actuality. The misgivings about her husband, which long practice and continual effort had taught her how to keep at bay, suddenly overleapt their artificial barriers and swarmed upon her. The long garden front of the dignified 18th century house, nearly the last villa in Hillport on the road to Oak Castle, extended before her. She played in that house as a child, and as a woman had watched from its windows the years go by like a procession. That house was her domain. Hers was the supreme intelligence brooding creatively over it. Out of walls and floors and ceilings, out of stairs and passages, out of furniture and woven stuffs, out of metal and earthenware, she had made a home. From the lawn, in the beautiful sadness of the autumn evening, anyone might have seen and enjoyed the sight of its high French windows, its glowing sun blinds, its faintly tinted and beribboned curtains, its creepers, its glimpses of occasional tables, tall vases and dressing mirrors. Leonora, as she sat holding the letter in her long white hand, would call up and see the interior of every room to the 
the most minute details. She, the housemistress, knew her home by heart. She had thought it into existence, and there was not a cabinet against a wall, not a rug on a floor, not a cushion on a chair, not a knick-knack on a mantelpiece, not a plate in a rack, but had come there by the design of her brain. Without possessing much artistic taste, Leonora had an extraordinary talent for domestic equipment, organisation and management. She was so interested in her home, so exacting in her ideals, that she could never reach finality. The place went through a constant succession of improvements. Its comfort and its attractiveness were always on the increase. And the result was so striking that her supremacy in the woman's craft could not be challenged. All Hillport, including her husband, bowed to it. Mrs. Stanway's principles, schemes, methods, even her trifling dodges, were mentioned with deep respect by the ladies of Hillport, who often expressed their astonishment that, although the wheels of Mrs. Stanway's household revolved with perfect smoothness, Mrs. Stanway herself appeared never to be doing anything. That astonishment was Leonora's pride. As her brain marshalled with ease the thousand diverse details of the wonderful domestic machine, she could appreciate better than any other woman in Hillport, without vanity and without humility, the singular excellence of her gifts and of the organism they had perfected. And now this creation of hers, this complex structure of meadow brick and mortar, and fine chattels and nice and luxurious habit, seemed to Leonora to tremble at the whisker of an enigmatic message from Uncle Meachang. The foreboding caused by the letter mingled with the menace of approaching age and with the sadness of the early autumn, and confirmed her mood. Innocent, her youngest, ran impulsively to her in the garden. Innocent was eighteen, and the days when she went to school and wore her hair in a long plait were still quite fresh in the girl's mind. This reason she was often inordinately and aggressively adult. Pa, I get to have my tea first thing. The Burgesses have asked me to play tennis. I needn't wait, need I? It gets dark so soon. As Millicent stood there, ardently persuasive, she forgot that adult persons do not stand on one leg or put their fingers in their mouths. Leonora looked fondly at the sprightly girl, vain, self-conscious, and bond and pretty as a doll in her white dress. She recognised all Millicent's faults and shortcomings, and yet was overcome by the charm of her presence. No, Milly, you must wait. Throned on the rustic seat, inscrutable and perilous Leonora, a wistful, wayward atom in the universe, laid her command upon the other wayward atom, and she thought how strange it was that this should be. Mama! Father specially said you must be in for tea. You know you've had far too much freedom. What have you been doing all the afternoon? I haven't been doing anything, Ma. Leonora feared for the strict veracity of her youngest, but she said nothing, and Milly retired full of annoyance against the inconceivable caprices of parents. At twenty minutes to seven, John Stanway entered his large and handsome dining room, having been driven home by David Payne, whose residence was close by. Three languorous women and the erect and motionless parlour-maid behind the door, were waiting for him. He went straight to his carver's chair, and instantly the women were alert, galvanised into vigilant life. Leonora, opposite to her husband, began to pour out the tea. The impassive parlour-maid stood consummately ready to hand the cups. Ethel and Millicent took their seats along one side of the table, with an air of nonchalance which was far from sincere. The chair on the other side remained empty. Turn the gas on, Bessie, said John. Daylight had scarcely begun to fail, but nevertheless the man's tone announced a grievance that, with half a dozen women in the house, he, the exhausted breadwinner, should have been obliged to attend to such a trifle. Bessie sprang to pull the chain of the well-spec hat, and the white and silver of the tea-table glittered under the yellow light. Every woman looked furtively at John's morose countenance. By the dark not fair, he was a tall man, verging towards obesity, and the fullness of his figure did not suit his thin, rather handsome face. His age was forty-eight. There was a small bald spot on the crown of his head. The thick brown beard seemed thick 
and Bentius, but this effect was given by the coarseness of the hairs, not by their number. The moustache was long and exiguous. His blue eyes were never still, and they always avoided any prolonged encounter with other eyes. He was a personable specimen of the clever and successful manufacturer. His clothes were well cut, the necktie of a discreet spartanist. His grandfather had begun life as a working potter. Nevertheless, John Stanway spoke easily and correctly in a refined variety of the broad five times accent. He could open a door for a lady, and was noted for his neatness in compliment. It was his ambition always to be calm, oracular, weighty, always to be sure of himself. But his temperament was incurably nervous, restless, and impulsive. He could not be still, he could not wait. Instinct drove him to action for the sake of action. Instinct made him seek continually for notice, prominence, comment. These fundamental appetites had urged him into public life, through the Borough Council and the Committee of the Wedgwood Institution. He often affected to be buried in consultation upon municipal and private business affairs, but in fact his attention was disengaged and watchful. Leonora knew that this was so tonight. The idea of his duplicity took possession of her mind. Peeps yawned before her, peeps that swallowed up the solid and charming house and the comfortable family existence, and she glanced at that face at once strange and familiar to her. Is it all right? kept thinking. Is John all that he seems? I wonder whether he has ever committed murder. Yes, even this absurd thought, which she knew to be absurd, crossed her mind. Where's Rose? he demanded suddenly, in the depressing silence of the tea table, as if he had just discovered the absence of his second daughter. She's been working in her room all day, said Leonora. There's no reason why she should be late for tea. At that moment, Rose entered. She was very tall and pale. Her dress was a little dowdy. Like her father and Millicent, she carried her head forward and had a tendency to look downwards, and her spine seemed flaccid. Ethel was beautiful, or about to be beautiful. Millicent was pretty. Rose, plain. Rose was deficient in style. She despised style, and regarded her sisters as frivolous ninnies and cadabouts. She was the serious member of the family, and for two years had been studying from the matriculation of London University. It again, said her father, I shall stop all this exam work. Rose said nothing, but looked resentful. When the hot dishes had been partaken of, Bessie was dismissed, and Leonora waited for the bursting of the storm. It was Millicent who drew it down. I think I should go down to the Burgesses after all, Mamma. It's quite light, she said with audacious pertness. Her father looked at her. What were you doing this afternoon, Milly? I went out for a walk, Pa. Who with? No one. Didn't I see you on the canal side with young Riley? Yes, Father. He was going back to the works after dinner, and he just happened to overtake me. Milly and Ethel exchanged a swift glance happened to overtake you. I saw you as I was driving past over the canal bridge. You little thought that I saw you. Oh, Father, I couldn't help him overtaking me. Besides... Besides, he took her up. You had your hand on his shoulder. How do you explain that? Millicent was silent. I am ashamed of you, regularly ashamed. You with your hand on his shoulder in full sight of the works, and on your mother's birthday, too. Leonora involuntarily stirred. For more than twenty years it had been his custom to give her a kiss and a ten-pound note before breakfast on her birthday. But this year he had so far made no mention whatever of the anniversary. I am going to put my foot down, he continued with grieved majesty. I don't want to, but you force me to it. I'll have no goings on with Fred Riley, understand that, and I'll have no more idling about. You girls, at least you do, own idol. Ethel shall begin to go to the works next Monday. I want a clerk. And you, Millie, must take up the housekeeping. Mother, you'll see to that. Leonora reflected that whereas Ethel showed a marked gift for housekeeping, Millie was instinctively averse to everything merely domestic. With a required fatalism, 
accepted the Ukasey. You understand? said John to his pert youngest. Yes, Papa. No more carrying on with Fred Riley or anyone else. No, Papa. I've got quite enough to worry me without being bothered by you girls. Rose left the table, consciously innocent both of sloth and of light behaviour. What are you going to do now, Rose? He could not let her off scot-free. Read my chemistry, father. You'll do no such thing. I must, if I'm to pass at Christmas, she said firmly. It's my weakest subject. Christmas or no Christmas, he replied, I'm not going to let you kill yourself. Look at your face. I wonder your mother... Run into the garden for a while, my dear, said Leonora softly. The girl moved to obey. Rose, he caught her back sharply as his exasperation became fidgety. Don't be in such a hurry. Open the window an inch. Ethel and Millicent disappeared after the manner of young fox terriers. They did not visibly depart. They were there, and looked away. They were gone. In the bedroom which they shared, the door well locked, they threw off all restraints, conventions, pretenses, and discussed the world, and their own world, with terrible candour. This sacred and untidy apartment, where many of the habits of childhood still lingered, was a retreat, a sanctuary from the law, and the fastness had been ingeniously secured against surprise by the peculiar position of the bedstead in front of the doorway. Father is a donkey, said Ethel. Ma never says a word, said Billy. I could simply have smacked him when he brought in Mother's birthday, Ethel continued savagely. So could I. I'd see him think it's you. What a lark. Yes, I don't mind, said Minnie. You are a brick, Minnie, and I didn't think you were. I didn't really. What a horrid pig you are, Eth. Billy protested, and Ethel laughed. Did you give Fred my note all right? Ethel demanded. Yes, answered Millie. I suppose he's coming up tonight. I asked him to. There'll be a frantic row one day, I'm sure there will, Minnie said meditatively, after a pause. Oh, there's bound to be, Ethel assented, and she added, Mother doesn't trust us. Have a shock. Minnie said yes, and Ethel drew a box of bonbons from her pocket. They seemed to contemplate with a fearful joy the probable exposure of that life of flirtations and chocolate, which ran its secret course side by side with the other life of demure propriety acted out for the benefit of the older generation. If these innocent and inexperienced souls had been accused of leading a double life, they would have denied the charge with genuine indignation. Nevertheless, driven by the universal longing, and abetted by parental apathy and parental lack of imagination, they did lead a double life. It chafed him bitterly under the code to which they were obliged ostensibly to submit. In their moods of revolt, they honestly believed their parents to be dull and obstinate creatures who had lost the appetite for romance and ecstasy, and were determined to mortify this appetite in others. They desired heaps of money, and a free, informal companionship of very young men. The latter, at the cost of some intrigue and subterfuge, they contrived to get. But money they could not get. Frequently they said to each other with intense earnestness that they would do anything for money, and they repeated passionately, Anything! Just look at that stuck-up thing, said Minnie, laughing. They stood together at the window, and Minnie pointed her finger at Rose, who was walking conscientiously to and fro across the garden in the gathering dusk. Ethel tapped on the pane, and the three sisters exchanged friendly smiles. Rose will never pass her exam, not if she was to be a hundred, said Ethel. And can you imagine father making me go to the works? Can you imagine the sense of it? I won't let you walk up with Fred at night, said Minnie, so you needn't think. And your housekeeping, Ethel exclaimed. What a treat father will have at meals. Oh, I can easily get round, mother, said Millie with confidence. I can't housekeep. Ma knows that perfectly well. Well, father will forget all about it in a week or two. That's one comfort. Ethel concluded the matter. Are you going down to Burgess's to see Harry? She inquired, observing Millie put on her hat. Yes, said Millie. Sissy said she'll come for me if I was late. I'd better stay in and be beautiful. I shall offer to play duets with mother. Won't you be long? Let's try that chorus for the operatic before supper. 
At night, after the girls had kissed them and gone to bed, John and Leonora remained alone together in the drawing room. The first fire of autumn was burning in the grate, and at the other end of the long room, dark curtains were drawn across the French window. Shaded candles lighted the grand piano in which Leonora was seated, and a single gas jet illuminated the region of the hearth, where John, lounging almost at full length in a vast chair, read the newspaper. Otherwise, the room was in shadow. John dropped the signal, and slid to the hearth rug with a rustle, and turned his head that he could just see the left side of his wife's face and her left hand as it moved over the keys of the piano. He played with gentle monotony, and her playing seemed perfunctory but agreeable. John watched the glinting of the four rings on her left hand and the slow undulations of the drooping lace at her wrist. He moved twice, and she knew he was about to speak. I say, Leonora, he said in a confidential tone. Yes, my dear, he responded, complying generously with his appeal for sympathy. She continued to play for a moment, but even more softly. And then, as he kept silence, she revolved on the piano stool and looked into his face. What is it? she asked in a caressing voice, intensifying her femininity, forgiving him, excusing him, thinking and making him think what a good fellow he was, despite certain superficial faults. You knew nothing of this Riley business, did you? he murmured. Oh, no. Are you sure there's anything in it? I don't think there is for an instant. But she did not. Even the placing of Millie's hand on Fred Riley's shoulder in full sight of the street. Even this she regarded only as the pretty indiscretion of a child. Oh, there's nothing in it, she repeated. Oh, there's got to be nothing in it. You must keep an eye on them. I won't have it. She leaned forward, and resting her elbows on her knees, put her chin in her long hands. Her bangles disappeared amid lace. What's the matter with Fred? said she. He's a relation. You've said before now that he's a good clerk. He's a decent enough clerk, but he's not for our girls. But it's only money, she began. Money? John cried. He'll have money. Oh, he'll have money right enough. Look here, Nora. I've not told you before, but I'll tell you now. Uncle Meshach's altered his will in favour of young Yarriley. Oh, Jack! John Stanway stood up, gazing at his wife with an air of martyrised virtue, and said, Now, what do you think of that as a specimen of the worries which I keep to myself? She raised her eyebrows with a gesture of deep concern, and all the time she was asking herself, Why did Uncle Meshach alter his will? Why did he do that? He must have had some reason. This question troubled her far more than the blow to their expectations. John's maternal grandfather had married twice. By his first wife, he'd had one son, Shadrach. And by his second wife, two daughters and a son, Mary, John's mother, Hannah and Meshach. The last two had never married. Shadrach had exchanged all his family, except old Ebenezer, by marrying beneath him. And Mary had earned praise by marrying rather well. These two children, an useful whim of the eccentric old man, had received their portions of the patrimony on their respective wedding days. They were both dead. Shadrach, amiable but incompetent, had died poor, leaving a daughter Susan, who repeated, even more reprehensibly, her father's sin of marrying beneath her. She married a working potter, and thus reduced her branch of the family to the status from which old Ebenezer had originally raised himself. Fred Riley, now an orphan, was Susan's only child. As an act of charity, John Stanway had given Fred Riley a stool in the office of his manufactory. But, though Fred's mother was John's first cousin, John never acknowledged the fact. John argued that Fred's mother and Fred's grandfather had made fools of themselves, and that the consequences were irremediable, save by Fred's unaided effort. Such vicissitudes of blood, and the social contracts resulting therefrom, are common enough in the history of families and democratic communities. Old Ebenezer's will left the residue of his estate, reckoned at some £15,000, to Meshach, 
and Hannah as joint tenants, the remainder absolutely to the survivor of them. By this arrangement, which suited them excellently since they had always lived together, though neither could touch the principle of their joint property during their joint lives, the survivor had complete freedom to dispose of everything. With Meshach and Hannah had made a will in sole favour of John. Yes, John said again. He's altered it in favour of young Riley. David Dane told me the other day. Uncle told Dane he might tell me. Why has he altered it? Leonora asked, all loud at last. John shook his head. Why does Uncle Meshach do anything? He spoke with sarcastic irritation. I suppose he's taken a sudden fancy for Susan's child after ignoring him all these years. And uh, has Aunt Hannah altered her will too? No, I'm all right in that quarter. Then if your Aunt Hannah lives longest, you'd still come in for everything, just as if your Uncle Meshach hadn't altered his will? Yes, but Aunt Hannah won't live forever. Uncle Meshach will. Where shall I be if she dies first? He went on in a different tone. Of course one of them's bound to die soon. Uncle's sixty-four if he's a day, and the old lady's a year older. But I want money. Do you, Jack, really? she said. Long ago she had suspected it, though John never stinted her. Once more the solid house and their comfortable existence seemed to shiver and be engulfed. By the way, Nora, he burst out with sudden bright animation, I've been so occupied today I forgot to wish you many happy returns. And here's the usual, I haven't got it on me this morning. He kissed her and gave her a ten pound note. Oh, thanks, Jack, she said, glancing at the note with a factitious curiosity to hide her embarrassment. You're good looking enough yet exclaimed as he gazed at her. He wants something out of me. He wants something out of me, she thought, as she gave him a smile for his compliment. And this idea that he wanted something, that the circumstances should have forced him into the position of an applicant, distressed her. She grieved for him. She saw all his good qualities, his energy, vitality, cleverness, facile kindliness, his large masculinity. It seemed to her, as she gazed up at him from the music stool in the shaded solitude of the drawing room, that she was very intimate with him, and very dependent on him. And she wished him to be always flamboyant, imposing, and successful. If you were at all hard up, Jack, she made as if to reject the note. Oh, get out, he laughed. Not a penner that I'm sure of. I'll tell you what you can do, she went on quickly and lightly. I was thinking of raising a bit temporarily on this house. Five hundred, say. You wouldn't mind, would you? The house was her own property, inherited from an aunt. Long suggestion came as a shock to her. A mortgage house? This was what he wanted? Oh, yes, certainly, if you like, she acquiesced quietly. But I thought, I thought business was so good just now, and... and so it is. He stopped her with a hint of annoyance. I'm short of capital, always have been. I see, he said, not seeing. Well, what would you like? Like my girl. Now, uh, roost. He extinguished the gas over the amethyst piece. The familiar vulgarity of some of his phrases always vexed her, and roost was one of those phrases. In a flash he fell from a creature engagingly masculine, the use worn daily share of her monotonous existence. Have you heard about Arthur Tremlow coming over? she demanded, half vindictively, as he was preparing to blow out the last candle on the piano. He stopped. Who's Arthur Tremlow? Mr Tremlow's son, of course, she said, from America. Oh, him. Coming over, did you say? I wonder what he looks like. Who told you? Uncle Meshach? He said I was to say you were to look out for yourself when Arthur Tremlow came. I didn't know what he meant. One of his jokes, I expect. He tried to laugh. John looked at her, and then looked away, and immediately blew out the last candle. But she'd seen him turn pale at what Uncle Bishak had said. Or was that pallor merely the effect on his face of raising the coloured candle shade as he extinguished the candle? She could not be sure. 
Uncle Bishak ought to be in the lunatic asylum, I think. John's voice came majestically out of the gloom as they groped towards the door. You'll have to be polite to Arthur Bremner when he comes, if he is coming, said John, after they'd gone upstairs. I understand he's quite a reformed character. Because she fancied she had noticed that the window at the end of the corridor was open, she came out of the bedroom a few minutes later and traversed the dark corridor to satisfy herself and found the window wide open. The night was cloudy and warm, and a breeze moved among the foliage of the garden. In the mysterious diffused light she could distinguish the forms of the poplar trees. Suddenly the bushes immediately beneath her were disturbed as though by some animal. Good night, Ethel. Good night, Fred. She shook with violent agitation as the amazing adieu from the garden was answered from the direction of her daughter's window. But the secondary effect of those words, so simply and affectionately whispered in the darkness, was to bring a tear to her eye. As her mother comprehended the whole staggering situation, the woman envied Ethel for her youth, her naughty innocence, her romance, her incredibly foolish audacity in thus risking the disaster of parental wrath. Leonora heard cautious footsteps on the gravel and the slow closing of a window. My life is over, she said to herself, and hers beginning. And to think that this afternoon I called her a schoolgirl. What romance have I had in my life? She put her head out of the window. There was no movement now, but above her, a radiant streaming from Rose's plumber showed that the serious girl of the family, defying command, plodded obstinately at her chemistry. As Leonora thought of Rose's ambition, and Ethel's clandestine romance, and little Millicent's complicity in that romance, and John's sinister secrets, and her own ineffectual repining. As she thought of these five antagonistic, preoccupied souls and their different affairs, the pathos and the complexity of human things surged over her and overwhelmed her. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of Leonora by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Two, Meshach and Hannah. The little old bachelor and spinster were resting after dinner in the back parlour of their house near the top of Church Street. In that abode, they had watched generations pass and manners change, as one list hearthrug succeeded another in the back parlour. Meshach had been born in the front room, and he meant to die there. Hannah had also been born in the front bedroom, but it was through the window of the back bedroom that the housewife's soul would rejoin the infant. The house which Meshach's grandfather, first of his line to emerge from the grey mass of the proletariat, had ruined himself to build, was a six-roomed dwelling of honest workmanship, in red brick and tile, with a beautiful pillared doorway and fanlight in the antique taste. It had cost two hundred pounds, and was the monument of a life's ambition. Mortgaged by its hard-pressed creator, and then sold by order of the mortgagee, it had ultimately been bought again in triumph by Meshach's father, who made thirty thousand pounds out of pots without getting too big for it, and left it unspoilt to Meshach and Hannah. Only one alteration had ever been made in it, and that, completed on Meshach's fiftieth birthday, admirably exemplified his temperament. Because he liked to observe the traffic in Church Street, and liked equally to sit in the back parlour near the hog, he had, with an oriental grandeur of self-indulgence, removed the dividing wall between the front and the back parlours, and substituted a glass partition, so that he could simultaneously warm the fire and keep an eye on the street. The town said that no one but Meshach could have hit on such a scheme, or he would have carried it out with such an object crowned his reputation. John Stanway's maternal uncle was one of those individuals whose character, at once strong, egotistic, and peculiar, so forcibly impresses the community 
but by contrast ordinary persons seem to be without character. Such men are therefore called, distinctively, characters, and it is a matter of common experience that, whether through the unconscious presence of parents, or through the felicitous sense of propriety which often guides the hazards of destiny, they usually bear names to match their qualities. Shack Mayat. Only Shack Mayat. What did he want with curious syllables to roll glibly off the tongue and to repeat for the pleasure of repetition? What a vision of Meshach their utterance conjured up. At sixty four, stereotyped by age, fixed and confirmed in singularity, Meshach's figure answered better than ever to his name. He was slight of bone and spare in flesh, with a hardly perceptible stoop. Had a red, seamed face. Under the small, pale blue eyes, genial and yet frigid, there showed a thick, raw, red selvage of skin, and below that the skin was loose and baggy. The wrinkled eyelids, instead of being shaped to the pupil, came down flat and perpendicular. His nose and chin were witch like, the nostrils large and elastic. The lips, drawn tight together, curved downwards indifferently captious. The short white beard grew sparsely on the chin. The skin of the narrow neck was fantastically drawn and creased. His limbs were thin, the knees and elbows sharpened to a fine point, the hands very long with blue corded veins. As a rule, his clothes were a distressing combination of black and dark blue. Either the coat, the waistcoat, or the trousers would be black, the rest blue. Trousers had the old-fashioned flap pockets, like a sailor's, with a complex apparatus of buttons. He wore loose white cuffs that were continually slipping down the wrist, a starched dicky, a collar of too lenient flexure, and a black necktie with a made bow that was fastened by means of a button and buttonhole under the chin to the right. Thirty times a day, Bichik had to secure this precarious cravat. Lastly, the top and bottom buttons of his waistcoat were invariably loose. He was of that small and lonely minority of men who never know ambition, ardour, zeal, yearning, tears, whose convenient desires are capable of immediate satisfaction, of whom it may be said that they purchase a second-rate happiness, cheap at the price of an incapacity for deep feeling. In his seventh decade, Rejack Myatt could look back with calm satisfaction at a career of uninterrupted nonchalance and idleness. A favourite of a stern father and of fate, he had never done a hard day's work in his life. When he and Hannah came into their inheritance, he realised everything except the house and invested the proceeds in consoles. With a roof, four hundred a year from the British Empire, a tame, capable sister, and at notoriously good health, he took final leave of care at the age of thirty-two. He wanted no more than he had. Leisure was his chief luxury. He watched life three meals, and had time to think about what he saw. Being gifted with a vigorous and original mind that by instinct held formulas in defiance, he soon developed a philosophy of his own, and his reputation as a character sprang from the first wayward expressions of this philosophy. Perceiving that the town not unadmiringly deemed him odd, he cultivated oddity. Perceiving also that he was sometimes astonished at the extent of his information about his hidden affairs, he cultivated mystery, a knowledge of other people's business, and the trick of unexpected appearances. At forty, his fame was assured. At fifty, he was an institution at sixty, an oracle. He shakes a mixture, and the local phrase. But in this mixture there was a less tedious posturing and a more massive intellect than you could go to the achievement of a provincial renown such as Mishak's. The man's externals were deceptive, for he looked like a local curiosity who might never have been out of Bursley. Mishak, however, sometimes travelled in the British Isles, thereby kept his ideas from congealing. And those who had met him in trains and hotels knew that the porters, waiters and drivers did not mistake his shrewdness for that of a simpleton determined not to be robbed. 
that he wanted the right things and had the art to get them. In short, that he was an expert in travel. Like many old provincial bachelors, while frugal at home, he could be profuse abroad, exercising the luxurious freedom of a bachelor. In the course of years, he grew steadily upon his fellow pew holders of the big Sitch chapel, that he was worldly minded and possibly contemptuous of their codes. Some, who made a speciality of smelling rats, accused him of gaiety. You better get something to take a cup of tea, sister, said Meshach, rousing himself. Why, brother? demanded Hannah. Some sausage oven, Meshach proceeded. Is anyone coming? she asked. Nor a bit of fish, said Meshach, gazing meditatively at the fire. Hannah rose and interrogated his face. You ought to have told me before, brother. Past three now, and Saturday afternoon, too. So saying, she hurried anxiously into the kitchen and told the servants to put her hat on. Who is it that Cummings, brother? she inquired later, with timid, ravenous curiosity. I see you'll have it out of me, said Meshach who gave up mysteries as a miser parked with gold. It's Arthur Twemlow from New York, and let that stop your mouth. Thus, the utterance of this name in the prim, archaic, stuffy little back parlour, Meechak raised the curtain on the last act of a drama which had slumbered for fifteen years since the death of William Twemlow, and which the principal actors in it had long thought to be concluded or suppressed. The whole matter could be traced back a series of situations which had developed one out of another, to the character of old Twemlow. The final romantic solution was only rendered possible by the peculiarities of Meshach Meyer. William Twemlow had been one of those men in whom an unbridled appetite for virtue becomes a vice. He loved God with such virulence that he killed his wife, drove his daughter into a fatuous marriage, and quarrelled irrevocably with his son. The too sensitive wife died for lack of joy. Alice escaped to Australia with a parson who never accomplished anything but a large family. And Arthur, at the age of seventeen, precociously cursed his father and sought in America a land where there were fewer commandments. Then old Tremlow told his junior partner, John Stanway, that the ways of Providence were past finding out. Stanway sympathised with him, partly from motives of diplomacy, and partly from a genuine misunderstanding of the case. Tremlow, mild, earnest, and a generous supporter of charities, was much respected in the town, and his lonely predicament excited compassion. Most people looked upon young Arthur as a godless and heartless vagabond. Alice's husband was a fool, impulsive and vain, and despite introductions, no congregation in Australia could be persuaded to listen to his version of the gospel. Alice gave birth to more children than bad sermons could keep alive, and soon the old man of Bursty was regularly sending remittances to her. Tremlow desired fervently to do his duty, and moreover the estrangement from his son increased his satisfaction in dealing handsomely with his daughter. The son would doubtless learn from the daughter how much he had lost by his impiety. Seven years elapsed or so, and then the parson gave up his holy calling and became a thief hunter in Brisbane. Quemlow was shocked at this defection, which seemed to him sacrilegious, and a chance phrase in a letter of Alice's requesting capital for the new venture, but too assured a demand and insufficient gratitude for past benefits, and he's never quite knew what about a second breach in the Twemlow family. The purse was closed, and perhaps not too early, for the improvidence of the tea blender and Alice's fecundity were a gulf whose depth no munificence could have plumbed. Again John Stanway sympathised with the now enfeebled old man. John advised him to retire, and Twemlow decided to do so, receiving one-third of the net profits of the partnership business during his life. In two years, he was bedridden, and the miserable victim of the housekeeper. But though both Alice and Arthur attempted reconciliation, some fine point of conscience obliged him to ignore their overtures. John Stanway, his last remaining friend, called often and chatted about business, which he lamented was far from being what it ought to be. 
Primrose's death was hastened by a fire in the works. It happened that he could see the flames from his bedroom window. He survived the spectacle for five days. Before entering into his reward, the great pietist wrote letters of forgiveness to Alice and Arthur, and made a will to put John Stanway as sole executor in favour of Alice. The town expressed surprise when he learnt that the estate was sworn at less than a thousand pounds. But the dead man's share in the profits of Tremlay and Stanway was no secret. Stanway had been living in splendour at Hillport for several years. John, when questioned by gossips, referred sadly to Alice's husband and to the depredations of housekeepers. In this manner, the name and memory of the Tremlows were apparently extinguished universally. But Meshach Wyatt had witnessed the fire at the works. He had even remained by the canal side all through that illuminated night. And an adventure had occurred to him, such as occurs only to the Meshach Wyatt of this world. The fire was threatening the office. Meshach saw his nephew John running to a place of refuge with a drawer snatched out of an American desk. The drawer was loaded with papers and books, and as John ran, a small book fell unheeded to the ground. Meshach cried out to John that he had dropped something, but in the excitement and confusion of the fire his rather high-pitched voice was not heard. He left the book lying where it fell. Half an hour afterwards he saw it again, picked it up, and put it in his pocket. It contained some interesting informal private memoranda of the annual profits of the firm. Now Meshach did not return the book to its owner. He argued that John deserved to suffer for his carelessness in losing it. John ought to have heard his call, and that anyhow John would have surely inquired for it, and might have been allowed to receive it, with a few remarks upon the need of a calm remedial of flowers. But John never did inquire for it. When William Tremlow's will was proved a few weeks later, Jack Myatt made no comment whatever. From time to time he heard news of Arthur Tremlow, that he had set up in New York as an earthenware and glassware factor. He was doing well. He was doing extremely well. His buyer had come over to visit the more aristocratic manufacturers of Knife and Calden. Someone from Bursley had met Arthur at the Hectic Easter Fair and reported him stout, taciturn, and medicalised. Then, one morning in Lord Street, Liverpool, fifteen years after the death of Old Tremlow and the misappropriation of the little book, Meshach encountered Arthur Tremlow himself. Jack was returning from his autumn holiday in the Isle of Man, and Arthur had just landed from the Serbia. The two men were mutually impressed by each other's skill in nicely conducting an interview which ninety-nine people out of a hundred would have botched. For they had last met as a boy of seventeen and a man of forty. They lunched richly at the Adelphi, and gave news the news. Arthur's buyer, it seemed, was dead. After a day or two in London, Arthur was coming to the Five Towns to buy a little in person. Meshach inquired about Alice in Australia, and was told that things were in a specially bad way with the tea blender. He said that you couldn't cure a fool. He remarked casually upon the smallness of the amount left by the old Tremlow. Arthur, unaware that Meshach Myatt was raising up an idea which for fifteen years had been buried and never forgotten in his mind, answered with nonchalance, the amount certainly was rather small. Arthur added, and in his dying letter of forgiveness to Alice, the old man had stated that his income from the work during the last year of his life had been less than two hundred per annum. Meshach worked his shut thin lips up and down and then began to discuss other matters. But as they parted at Lime Street Station, the observer of life had said to Arthur with presaging charm, be in the five pounds at the end of the week. Come and have a cup of tea with me and Hannah on Saturday afternoon. Bill, what you know, top of Church Street. I've something to show you as will interest you. There was a pause and an interchange of glances. Right, said Arthur Tremlow. Thank you. I'll be there at a quarter to four or thereabouts. It's like as if what must be, Meshack murmured to himself, with almost sad resignation in the enigmatic idiom of five towns. But he was highly pleased that he, the first of all the townsfolk, would have seen Arthur Tremlow 
after 25 years' absence. When Hannah, in silk, like the most interesting and disconcerting American stranger in the lobby, smell of burstly sausage frizzling in the kitchen, added a warm finish to her confused welcome. She remembered him perfectly. Hey, Mr. Arthur, she said. I remember you that well. That was all she could say, except, Take off your overcoat and you make yourself at home, Mr. Arthur. I guess I know you, said the governor, touched by the girlish shyness, the primeval innocence, and the passionate hospitality of the little grey-haired thing. As he took off his glossy blue overcoat and hung it up, he seemed to fill the narrow lobby with his large frame and his quiet but penetrating, attractive American accent. He probably weighed fourteen stone. The elegance of his suit and his boots, the clean-shaven chin, the fineness of the lines of the nose, and the alert eyes set back under the temples redeemed him from grossness. He looked under rather than over, probably. His brown hair was beginning to recede from the forehead, a heavy moustache, which entirely hit his mouth and was austerely trimmed at the sides, might have aroused the envy of a firm of the bazaars. Come in, Wood, cried Mushak impatiently from the hall. Come in and let's be pecking a bit. As Arthur and Hannah entered the parlour, he added, She's gotten the sausages for you. She would get them, but I told her you'd take us as you found us. I told her that. But women, oh, you know what they are. Hey, Mishak, Mishak. Old damsel protested sadly and escaped into the kitchen. And when Meechak insisted that the guests should serve out the sausages, and Hannah, passing his tea, said it was a shame to trouble him, the no slipped suddenly back into the old life and ways and ideas. This existence, which she thought was entirely forgotten, returned again and triumphed for a time over all the experiences of his manhood. It alone seemed real honest, defensible. Sensations of his long and restless career in New York flashed through his mind as he impaled Hannah's sausages in the curious parlour, the hysteric industry of his girl typist, the continuous hot water service in the bedroom of the glittering apartment of the Concord House, the beautiful night at Foster and Biles Music Hall, an insanely extravagant dinner at Sherry's on his thirtieth birthday, a difficulty once with an emissary of Take of flies in summer. And, during all these racing years of clangour and success in New York, the life of Bursley, self sufficient and self contained, had preserved its monotonous and slow stolidity. Bursley had become a museum to him. He entered it as he might have entered the Middle Ages, and was astonished to find that beautiful that once he had deemed sordid and commonplace. Some of the streets seemed like a monument of the past, a picturesque survival. The crate floats, drawn by swift shaggy ponies and driven by men who balance themselves erect on two thin boards while flying round corners, struck him as the greatest thing in the world. And what's going on nowadays in old Bosley, Miss Myatt? he asked expansively, trying to drop his American accent and use the dialect. Eh, bless us, exclaimed Hannah, startled. Nothing ever happens here, Mr. Arthur. He felt that nothing did happen there. Same here as elsewhere, said Meshach. People living, getting child at a worry on, and dying. I feel cure of it, seemingly. Is there anything different to that in New York, or can they do without cemeteries? Clemo laughed. And again he had the illusion of coming back to reality after a long and hurried dream. Nothing seems to have changed here. Lightly. Nothing changed, said Meshach. Nay, nay, we're up in the world. We've got the steam car and we've got bars. We watch our sin nowadays. And there's talk of a park and a pond with a drum on it. We're moving with the times, my lad, and so's the race. It gave him pleasure to be called my lad by old Meshach. It was piquant to him that the first earthenware factor in New York, the Jupiter of a 14th Street office, should be addressed a stripling. And where is the park to be? He smilingly inquired. By the railway station opposite your father's old works as was. Broad villas now. Well, said Gwenlo, that sounds pretty nice. I feel if I'll get you to come around with me and show off the sights. Say, he added suddenly, do 
you remember being one that worked one day when my poor father was on me like half a hundred of bricks and you said, the boy's all right, Mr. Plumlow? I have forgotten that. I thought of it scores of times. Nay, he said on carelessly. I remember nothing all out. I don't know which dash was of him. It was his memory of the minute incident which more than anything else had encouraged him to respond so cordially to Meshach the Blanches in Liverpool. He was by no means facile in social intercourse. And Mushak had rudely forgotten the effect of the scene. He felt diminished, and saw in the old bachelor a personification of the blunt and dependent spirit of the five towns. It is late today, said Anna, her brother, timorously breaking the silence which ensued. Millie, said Mr. Twemlow, what her proper name is, Anna said quickly, but we call her Millie. Your nephew's youngest. Yes, of course, the miller commented, on the mild family tree being sketched for him by the united death of a brother and sister. I recollect now you told me in Liverpool that Mr. Stanway was married. Who did he marry? He checked my pushed back his chair and stood up. John catched on to Knight's daughter, the doctor at Turnhill, he said, reaching to a cigar cabinet on the sideboard. Best thing he ever did in his life. One's among the better end of folk now. People said it would have come down for her. But Leonora isn't the sort that comes down. She's got blood in her. That, he snapped his fingers, is a good present. Old Knight's father came from up York way. Ah, she's a good old Pamela and Stanway, is Leonora. Pamela smiled at this persistence with respect to the past. Have a weed, said Meshack, offering him a cigar. I did all right, said J.S. Murius. Yes, he resumed. Maybe you don't remember old night, sister, as that that far house up at Hillport. When she died, she left it to Leonora, and they lived there this dozen year or more. Well, I guess she's got a handsome name for her, Trimble remarked perfunctorily, rising and leaving Hannah alone at the table. And she's the handsomest woman in the five towns, that I do know, said Meshach in the grand manner of a connoisseur, he lighted his cigar. And I was forty, day or four yesterday, he added with caustic emphasis. Me, Jack, cried Hannah, put a shame of yourself. And he turned to Tremlow, smiling and blushing a little. Not me. Hey, eh, but Mrs. John's a great favourite of my brother's. I'm sure her girls are very good and attentive. Not a day but one or other of them calls to see me. Not a day. Eh, but Mr. Day, I should think the world was coming to an end. And I'm expecting Millie today. What to made the dear guard so late? I will say this for John, asserted Meshach, as though the little housewife had not been speaking. I will say this for John, he repeated, stepping himself by the hall. He knew how to pick up a damned fine woman. Meshach, Hannah expostulated again. Something in the excellence of Meshach's cigars, in his way of calling a woman fine, in the dry, aloof masculinity of his attitude toward Hannah, gave Tremlow to reflect that in the fundamental deeps of experience, New York was perhaps not so far ahead of the old five towns after all. There was a fluttering in the lobby, and Millicent ran into the parlour hurriedly, negligently. I can't stay a minute, Auntie, the vivacious girl burst out in the unmistakable absence of condescending purpose. And then she caught sight of the well-dressed, good-looking man in the corner, and her bearing changed as though by a conjuring trick. She flushed sensitively, stroked her blue serge frock, posed her immature features to the mask of the finished lady playing a call, and summoned every faculty to aid her in looking her best. Well, this chit is the daughter of our mild mayor and aura, said Tremlow. I suppose you don't remember old Mr. Tremlow, my dear, said Hannah. Proudly introduced her niece. Oh, Auntie, how silly you are. Of course I remember him quite well. I really can't stay, Auntie. You'll stay and drink this cup of tea with me, Anna insisted firmly. Millie was obliged to submit. It was not often that the old lady exercised authority, but on that afternoon the famous New York visitor was just as much an audience for Hannah as for Hannah's great niece. Tremlow could think of nothing to say to this pretty, pouting creature who had rushed in from a later world and dissipated the atmosphere of medievalism. And so he addressed himself to Meshach upon the eternal subject of the state of trade. 
And we met at the table talked quietly, but something to say. The Pueblo saw many faults in the state's parking after three refusals. Even while still masticating the viscid, unripe parking, Millie rose to depart. She bent down and beautifully grazed with her lips the cheek of the laughing maker. Bye, Auntie. Bye, Uncle. And in an elegant, mincing tone, Good afternoon, Mr. Tremlow. I suppose you've just got to be on time at the next place, he said quizzically, smiling at her vivid youth in spite of himself. Something very important? No, oh, very important, she laughed archly, reddening, and then was gone. And Aunt Hannah followed her to the door. What the old folks lose, murmured Meshach apparently to the far, as he put his half-consumed cigar into the meerschaum holder. Goes to the prophet of young Burgess, as he's waiting outside the bank at the top of the square. I see, said Tremlow, and thought primly that in his day such laxities were not permitted. Anna and the servant cleared the tea table. The two men were left alone, each silently reducing J.S. Villurius to ashes. Meshach seemed to grow smaller in his padded chair by the hole, to become torpid, and to lose that keen sense of his own astuteness which alone gave zest to his life. Arthur stared out of the window of the confined backyard. The orphan dusk opened. Suddenly Meshach sprang up and lighted the gas, and as he adjusted the height of the flame, he remarked casually, So your sister Alice is as poorly off as ever? I know assented with a nod. By the way, he said, you told me on Wednesday you had something interesting to show me. Meshach made no answer, but picked up the poker and struck several times a large pewter platter on the mantelpiece. Do you want anything, brother? said Hannah, hastening into the room. Go over to my bedroom, sister, and in the left-hand pigeonhole in the bureau you'll see a little flat tissue paper parcel. Bring it to me. It's marked J.S. Yes, brother, he departed. You said as your father had told your sister as he never got no more than two hundred a year from the partnership after he retired. Yes, Tremor replied. That's what you wrote me. In fact, you sent me the old chap's letter to read. So I reckon it cost him most of all he got to live. Well, the old man said, and Hannah returned with the parcel that he carefully unwrapped. That'll do, sister. Hannah disappeared. Sivvy. Seriously drew Arthur's attention to a little green book whose cover still showed traces of blood and water. And what's this? I know Arthur would assume his likeness. Meshach gave him the history of his adventure at the fire, and then laboriously displayed and expanded the contents of the book, peering into the yellow pages through the steel rimmed spectacles that had been put on for the purpose. And you've kept it all this time? said Bruno. I've kept it. Man grimly. And Emma felt that that was precisely what Meshack Mired might have been expected to do. See, said Meshack, when their heads were close together, that's the year before your father's death, 292 pounds. The year before that, 1207 pounds. The year before that, bless us, have I turned over two pages at once? And so he continued. Then his heart began to beat heavily as Meshach's eyes met his. He seemed to see his father as a pathetic, cheated simpleton, and to hear the innumerable children of his sister crying for food. He remembered that in the old thirsty days he had always distrusted John Stanway, a conceited, fussy, imposing young man of twenty-two, who his father had taken the partnership and utterly believed him. He forgot that he had hated his father and his mind was obsessed by a sentimental and pure passion for justice. I say, Mr. Myatt, he exclaimed with sudden roughness, you suggest that John Stanway didn't do my father right? The lad I'm doing no suggesting, and you can keep the book if you've a mind to. I said nothing to no one. And if I had not met you in Liverpool, and you hadn't told me that your sister was poorly off again, after I should have been mummed to my grave. And that's how things turn out. Your own nephew, you know, said Tremlow. Aye, said the old man, I know that. But that bears fair. He checked his tone, frigidly jocular, almost frightened of the American. But according to you, said he, determined to put 
take his word. Your nephew robbed my father each year of sums varying from one to three hundred pounds. That's what it comes to. Nay, not according to me. According to that book, what your father told your sister Alice. He said corrected. Why should he do it? That's what I want to know. Look here, said Meshach quietly, resuming his chair. John's was put a man of business as you beat in a day's march. Never since he handled money could he keep off stocks and shares. He speculates, always has, always will. And now you know it, and just everybody as does either. Then you think, maybe lad I don't, said Meshach quietly. What ought I to do? Meshach cackled in laughter. Ask your sister Alice, he replied. It's her as is interested, not you. You are in the will. I don't want to ruin John Stanway, Bremer protested. Ruin John? He exactly exclaimed, cackling again. Not you. Women have no scandals in the family. But you can go and see him. Bad like, I reckon. Just think as John will be stuck fast for six or seven hundred or eight hundred. Not John. Happen a bit of money will come in hand to the old parson deep in the Bible accounts. Suppose my father made some mistake, for God. Aye, said Meshach calmly. Suppose he did. And suppose he did not. I believe I'll go and talk to Stanway, said Stanway, putting the book in his pocket. Let's see, the work sits down at Shawport. Some are good, said Meshach. I can say Alice has asked me to look at the accounts. Oh, perhaps I can straighten it out neat. He spoke carefully and stopped. It's fifteen years ago. Fifteen, said Meshach with gravity. I'm damned if I can make you out, said Tremler, as he walked along King Street towards the steam tram for Nipe, where he was staying at the Five Towns Hotel. Hannah had sped him with gushing and rustling bush silk from Meshach's door. I'm damned if I can make you out, Meshach, he said it aloud. And yet, so complex and self-contradictory is the mind's action under certain circumstances, he could make out Meshach perfectly well. He could discern clearly that Meshach had been actuated partly by the love of chicane, partly by a quasi infantile curiosity to see what he should see, and partly by an almost biblical sense of justice, a sense blind, Callous, cruel. End of chapter two. Chapter three of Leonora by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter three. The Call. It was the trust anniversary of the Sitch Chapel, and two sermons were to be delivered by the Reverend Dr. Simon Quain. During fifteen years, none but he had preached the trust sermons. Even in the morning, when pillars of the church were often disinclined to assume the attitude proper to pillars, the plain was almost crowded. But it was impossible to ignore the doctor. He was an expert geologist, a renowned lecturer, the friend of men of science and sometimes their foe, the contributor to the Encyclopaedia Britannica, and the author of a book of travel. He did not belong to the school of divines who annihilated Huxley by asking him from the pulpit to tell them if protoplasm was the origin of all life, what was the origin of protoplasm. Dr. Quain was a man of genuine attainments, at which the highest criticism could not sneer and when he visited personally the facile agnostics of the town, the young and experienced who knew more than their elders, were forced to take cover. Dr. Quain, whose learning exceeded even theirs, so the elders sarcastically ventured to surmise, was not ashamed to believe in the inspiration of the Old Testament. He could reconcile the chronology of the earth's crust with the first chapter of Genesis. He had a satisfactory explanation of the Jonine Gospel, and his mere existence was an impregnable fortress from which the adherents of the banner of belief could not be dislodged. On this Sunday morning, he offered a simple evangelical discourse, enhanced by those occasional references to Paleozoic and post-tertiary periods that were expected from him, 
and which he had enough of the wisdom of the serpent to supply. His grave and assured utterances banished all doubts, fears, misgivings, apprehensions, and the timid waverers smiled their relief at being freed, by the confidence of this illustrious authority, from the distasteful exertion of thinking for themselves. The collection was immense, and in addition to being immense, it provided for the worshippers an agreeable and legitimate excitement of curiosity. The plate usually entrusted to Meshach Mayat was passed from pew to pew, and afterwards carried to the communion rail by a complete stranger, a man extremely self-possessed and well attired, with a heavy moustache, a curious dimple in his chin, and a melancholy eyes, a man obviously of considerable importance somewhere. Oh, Mama, Miss admitted to her mother, who was alone with her in the Stanway pew, you look as Mr. Tremlow. Several men in the congregation knew his identity, and one, a commercial traveller, had met him in New York. Before the final hymn was given out, half the chapel had pronounced his name in surprise. His overt act of assisting in the offertory was favourably regarded. It was thought to show a nice social feeling on his part, and he did it with such distinction. The older people remembered that his father had always been a collector. They were constrained now to readjust their ideas concerning the son. And these ideas, rooted in the single phrase, ran away from home, and set fast by time, were difficult of adjustment. The impressiveness of Dr. Crane's sermon was impaired by this diversion of interest. Members of the Stanway family, in order to avoid the crush in the aisles and portico, always remained in their pew after service until the chapel had nearly emptied itself, and today Leonora chose to sit longer than usual. John had been too fatigued to rise for breakfast. Rose was struck down by a sick headache and Ethel had stayed at home to nurse Rose, so far as Rose would allow herself to be nursed. Leonora felt no desire to hurry back to the somewhat perilous atmosphere of Sunday dinner. Moreover, she shrank nervously from the possibility of having to make the acquaintance of Mr. Twemlow. But when she and Milly at length reached the outer vestibule, the concourse of people still lingered there, and among them Arthur was just bidding goodbye to the Maya. Anna, rather short-sighted, did not observe Leonora and Minnie. Pichac gave them his curt, quizzical nod, and the aged train departed. Then Millicent, proud of her acquaintance with the important stranger, and burning to be seen in converse with him, left her mother's side and became an independent member of society. How do you do, Mr. Tremlow? she said. Ah, he replied, recognising her with a bow of the sufficiency of which it intoxicated the young girl. What in such a hurry this morning? Oh, no, she agreed with a smiling effusion. They both glanced with furtive embarrassed swiftness at Leonora. Mama, this is Mr. Tremlow. Mr. Tremlow, my mother. The dashing, modish air of the child was adorable. Having concluded her scene, she retired from the centre of the stage in a glow. Arthur Tremlow's manner altered at once as he took Leonora's hand and saw the sudden generous miracle which happened in her calm face when she smiled. He was impressed by her beautiful maturity, by the elegance born of a restrained but powerful instinct transmitted to her through generations of ancestors. His respect for Meshach rose higher, and she, as she faced the self-possessed admiration in Arthur's eyes, was conscious of her finished beauty even of the piquancy of the angle of her hat, and the smooth, immaculate whiteness of her gloves. And she was proud, too, of Millicent's grace and restless charm. They walked down the steps, side by side, Leonora in the middle, watched curiously from above and below by little knots of people who still lingered in front of the chapel. "'You soon got to work here, Mr. Twemlow," said Leonora lightly. She laughed. I guess you mean that collecting box. That was Mr. Myatt's game. He didn't do me right, you know. He took me into his pew and then put the plate onto me. Eleonora liked his Americanism of accent and phrase. It seemed romantic to her. It seemed to signify the quick alertness, the vivacious and surprising turns of existence in New York, where the unexpected and the extraordinary give a zest to every day. 
Well, you reflected perfectly, he remarked. Oh, yes, you did really, Mr. Tremlow, echoed Millicent. Did I, he said, accepting the tribute with frank satisfaction. I used to collect one sort of towelmaker's shirt in Brooklyn. You've heard towelmage over here, of course. He faintly indicated contempt for towelmage. And after my first collection, he sent for me into the church parlour, and he said to me, Mr. Tremlow, next time you collect, put some snap into it. Don't go shuffling along as if you were dead. So, you see, this morning, although I hadn't collected for years, I thought of that and tried to put some snap into it. Milly laughed obstreperously. Leonora smiled. At the corner, they could see Mrs. Burgess's carriage waiting at the vestry door in Mount Street. The geologist, escorted by Harry Burgess, got into the carriage where Mrs. Burgess already sat. Harry followed him, and the stately equipage drove off. Dr. Quain had married a cousin of Mrs. Burgess's late husband, and he invariably stayed at her house. All this had to be explained to Arthur Tremlow, who made a point of being curious. By the time they had reached the top of Old Castle Street, Leonor felt an impulse to ask him, without ceremony, to walk up to Hillport and have dinner with them. He knew that she and Millie were pleasing him, and this assurance flattered her. But she could not summon the enterprise necessary for such an unusual invitation. Her lips could not utter the words. She could not force them to utter the words. He hesitated as if to leave them, and quite automatically, without being able to do otherwise, Leonora held her hand to bid goodbye. He waited with reluctance. The moment was passing, and she had not even asked him where he was staying. She had learned nothing of the man of whom Meshach had warned her husband to beware. Good morning, he said. I'm very glad to have met you. Perhaps... Won't you come and see us this afternoon if you aren't engaged? She suggested quickly. My husband will be anxious to meet you, I know. He appeared to vacillate. How do you, Mr. Tremlow? urged Millie, enchanted. It's sir, very good of you, he said. I shall be delighted to call. It's quite a considerable time since I saw Mr. Stanway. He laughed. This was his first reference to John. I'm so glad you asked him, Ma, said Millie, as they walked down Old Castle Street. Your father said we must be polite to Mr. Tremlow. Her mother replied coldly. He's frightfully rich, I'm sure, Millie observed. At dinner, Leonora told John that Arthur Tremlow was coming. No good, he said. Nothing more. In the afternoon, the mother and the eldest and youngest, supine and examinant in the drawing room, were surprised into expectancy by the sound of the front doorbell before three o'clock. He's here, exclaimed Millie, who was sitting near Leonora on the long Chesterfield. Ethel, her face flushed by the fire, lay like a curving wisp of straw in John's vast armchair. Leonora was reading. She put down the magazine and glanced briefly at Ethel, then at the aspect of the room. In silence she wished that Ethel's characteristic attitudes could be a little more demure and sophisticated. She wondered how often this apparently artless girl had surreptitiously seen Fred Riley since the midnight meeting on Thursday. And she was amazed that a child of hers, so kindly disposed, could be so naughty and deceitful. The door opened, and Ethel set out the fire. Mr. Burgess, the parlourmaid announced. The three women sank back, disappointed, and yet relieved. Harry Burgess, though barely of age, one of the acknowledged dandies of the world. Slim and fair, with a frank, but rather simple countenance, he supported his stylistic apparel with a natural grace that attracted sympathy. Just at present he was achieving a spirited effect by always wearing an austere black necktie fastened with a small gold safety pin. He wore this necktie for weeks to a bewildering variety of suits, and then plunged into a wild, polychromatic debauch of neckties. Upon all the niceties of masculine dress, the details of costume proper to a particular form of industry or recreation or ceremonial, he was a genuine authority. His cricketing panels, he was a fine cricketer and lawn tennis player of the sinuous oriental sort, were the despair of other dandies and the scorn of the sloven. He caused the material before it was made up, 
be boiled for many hours by the Burgess charwoman under his own superintendence. He had extraordinary aptitude for drawing corks, lacing boots, putting curry rolls on walking sticks, opening latched windows from the outside, and loading cigarettes. He could make a cigarette with one hand, and not another man in the five pounds ever said could do that. His slender, complex silver cigarette case invariably contained the only cigarettes worthy of the palate of a connoisseur, as his pipes were invariably the only pipes fit for the combustion of truly high-class tobacco. Old women, especially charwomen, adored him. But even municipal seigneurs admitted that Harry was a smart Fatherless, he was the heir to a tolerable fortune, the bulk of which, during his mother's life, he had not touched save with her consent. But his mother and his sister seemed to exist as chiefly for his convenience. His fair hair and his facile smile vanquished them, and vanquished most other people also. And already, when it happened to be crossed, there would always appear on his winning face the pouting, hard, resentful lines of the man who has learned to accept compliance as a right. He had small intellectual power, and no ambition at all. A considerable part of his prospective fortune was invested in the admirable shares of the Birmingham, Sheffield and District Bank, and it pleased him to sit on a stool in the Bursley branch of this bank, since he wanted, for a temporary and dignified avocation, without either the anxieties of trade or the competitive tests of a profession. He was a beautiful bank clerk, but he had once thrown a bundle of cheques into the office fire while aiming at a basket on the mantelpiece. The whole banking world would have been agitated and disorganised had not another clerk snatched the bundle from peril at the expense of his own fingers. The instant, still legendary behind the counter of the establishment at the top of the Milk Square, kept Harry awake to the seriousness of life for several weeks. Well, Harry, said Leonora with languid good nature, Made his homage in form to the mistress of the house, raised his eyebrows at Billy with a gesture, smiled upon Ethel, who feebly waved a hand as if too exhausted to do more, and then sat down on the piano stool, carefully easing the strain on his trousers and knees, and exposing an inch of fine wool sock above his American boots. He was a familiar of the house, and had had the unconditional entree since he and the Stanway girls first went to the high school at Oldcastle. I hope I haven't disturbed your beauty in sleep, any of you, was his angry remark. Yes, you have, said Ethel. He continued, I just came in to seek a little temporary relief from the excellent pain. Pain at breakfast, pain at chapel, pain at dinner. I got him to slumber on one side of the hearth and mother on the other, and then I slipped away in case they awoke. If they do, I've told Sissy to say that I've gone out to take a tract to a sick friend back in five minutes. Oh, Harry, you are silly, Millicent laughed. Everyone, including the narrator, was amused by this elaborate fiction of the managing of those two impressive persons, Mrs. Burgess and the venerable Christian geologist, by a kind, indulgent, bald Harry. Leonora, who had resumed her magazine, looked up and smiled the guarded smile of the mother. I'm afraid you're getting worse, she murmured and his candid and seductive face told her that while he was on no account not to be regarded as a gay dog, and a sad dog, and a worldly dog, yet nevertheless he and she thoroughly appreciated and understood each other. She did indeed like him, and she found pleasure in his presence. He gratified the eye. "'I wish you'd sing something, Milly," he began again after a pause. "'No,' said Milly, "'I'm not going to sing now.' Can't you, Mrs. Stanway? Well, what do you want me to sing? Sing Love is a Plaintive Song out of the second act. Harry was the newly appointed secretary of the Firstly Amateur Operatic Society, of which both Ethel and Millicent were members. In a few weeks' time, the society was to render patients in the town hall for the benefit of local charities, and rehearsals were occurring frequently. Oh, I'm not patient, many objected. Stiffly, he was only Ella. Besides, I mayn't, may I, Mamma? Your father might not like it, said Leonora. The dad has taken Bran out for a walk, they eh? would trouble him, said the objected sleepily under her breath. 
Well, but look here, yeah, Mrs. Downway, said Harry conclusively. The organism of Wesley and the chapel actually pays the sex debt for the patients for a voluntary. What about that? If there's no harm in that. Dear Nora surrendered. Come on, Mill, he commanded. I shall have to return to my muttons directly. And he opened the piano. But I tell you, I'm not patient. Come on, you know the music all right. Then we'll try Ella's bit in the first act. I'll play. Millicent arose, shook her hair, and walked up to the piano with the mien of a prima donna who has the capitals of Europe at her feet. Exultant in her youth, her charm, her voice, revelling unconsciously in the vivacity of her blood, and consciously in her power over Harry, which Harry strove in vain to conceal under an assumed equanimity. And, as Millicent sang the ballad, Leonora was beguiled by her singing into a mood of vague and overpowering melancholy. It seemed tragic that that fresh and pure voice, that innocent vanity, and that untested self-confidence should change and fade as maturity succeeded adolescence and decay succeeded maturity. It seemed intolerable that the ineffable charm of the girl's youth must be slowly filched away by the tests of time. I was like that once, and Jack too, she thought, as she gazed absently at the pair in front of the piano. And it appeared incredible to her that she was the mother of that tall, womanly creature. A little morsel of a child that she had born one night had become a daughter of Eve, with a magic to mesmerise errant glances and desires. She had a glimpse of the significance of nature's eternal iterance. Then her mood developed a bitterness against Millicent. She thought, cruelly, that Millicent's magic was no part of the girl's soul, no talent acquired by loving exertion, but something extrinsic, unavoidable, and unmeritorious. Why was it so? Why should fate treat Millie like a godchild? Why should she have prettiness and adorableness and lyric the gift? such a bounding, confident youth. Why should the circumstances fall out so that she could meet her unacknowledged lover openly at all seasons? Leonora's eyes wandered to the figure of Ethel, reclining with shut eyes in the armchair. Ethel, in her graver and more diffident beauty, had already begun to taste the sadness of the world. Ethel might not stand victoriously by her lover in the midst of the drawing-room, or joyously flip his ear when he struck a wrong note on the piano. Ethel, far more passionate than the active Millie, could only dream of her lover and see him by stealth. Leonora grieved for Ethel, and envied her too, for her dreams, and for her solitude, assuaged by clandestine trysts. Those trysts lay heavy on Leonora's mind. Although she had discovered them, she had done nothing to prevent them. From day to day she put off the definite parental act of censure and interdiction. He was appalled by the serene duplicity of her girls. Yet what would she say? Words were so trivial, so conventional. And though she objected to the match, wishing with ardour that Ethel might marry far more brilliantly, she believed as fully in the honest, warm kindliness of Fred Riley as in that of Ethel. And what else matters after all? She tried to think. The reverie shifted to Rose, unfortunate Rose, victim of peculiar ambitions, of a weak digestion, and of a harsh temperament that repelled the sympathy it craved, but was too proud to invite. She felt that she ought to go upstairs and talk to the prostrate Rose, in a curt, matter-of-fact tone that Rose ostensibly preferred. But she did not wish to talk to Rose. Ah, well, she reflected finally with an inward sigh, as though to whisper the last word and free herself of this preoccupation. They will all be as old as me one day. Mr. Tremlow, said the parlourmaid. Millie deliberately lengthened the high, full note, and then stopped and turned towards the door. Bravo! Arthur Tremlow answered at once the challenge of her whole figure, but he seemed to ignore the fact that he had caused an interruption and there was something in his voice that piqued the cantatrice, something that sent her back to the days of short frocks. She glanced nervously aside at Harry, who had struck a few notes and then dropped his hands from the keyboard. Tremlow's demeanour towards the rushing Ethel, when Leonora 
her forward with much more decorous and sympathy. As for Harry, to whom his arrival was a surprise, at first rather annoying, Pemlo treated the young back as one man of the world should treat another, and Harry's private verdict upon him was extremely favourable. Nevertheless, Leonora noticed that the three young ones seemed to now shrink into themselves to become passive instead of active, and by a common instinct to assume the character of mere spectators. How may I choose this place? said Twemlow, and sat down by Leonora in the other corner of the coast field and looked round. She could see that he was admiring the spacious room and herself in her beautiful afternoon dress, and the expensive and the sprightly comeliness of her quarters. His wandering eyes returned to hers, and their appreciation pleased her and increased her charm. I'm expecting my husband every minute, she said. Papa's gone out for a walk with Bran, Billy added. Oh, Bran, he repeated the word in a voice that humorously appealed for further elucidation. Both Ethel and Harry laughed. There's an Bernard, you know, Billy explained, annoyed. I wouldn't be surprised if that was a St. Bernard out there, he said, pointing to the French window. What a fine fellow, and what a fine garden. Bran was to be seen nosing low down at the window, and alternately lifting two huge white paws in his futile anxiety to enter the room. And I dare say John is in the garden, Leonora exclaimed with a sudden animation, glad to be able to dismiss the faint, uneasy suspicion which had begun to form in her mind that John meant, after all, to avoid Arthur Cremlow. Would you like to look at the garden? she demanded, half rising, and lifting her brows to a pretty invitation. Very much indeed, he replied, and he jumped up with the impulsiveness of a boy. It's quite warm, she said, and thanked Harry for opening the window for them. A fine, severe garden, he remarked enthusiastically outside, after he had descanted to Bran on Bran's amazing perfections, and the dog had greeted his mistress. A fine, severe garden, he repeated. Yes, she said, lifting her skirt across the lawn. I know what you mean. I wouldn't have it altered for anything, but many people think it's too formal. My husband does. Why, it's just English. And that old wall and the yew trees, I tell you. She expanded once more to his appreciation, which she took to herself. The number she, and the gardener, who was also the groom and worked under her, was responsible for the garden. But as she displayed the African marigolds and the late roses, and the hardy outdoor chrysanthemums, and as she patted Bran, who dawdled under her hand, she looked furtively around at John. She hoped he might be in the stables, and when in their tour of the grounds they reached the stables and he was not there, she hoped they would find him in the drawing room on their return. Her suspicion reasserted itself, and it was strengthened, against her reason, by the fact that Arthur Tremlow made no comment on John's invisibility. In the dusk of the spruce stable, where an enamelled nameplate over the manger of a loose box announced as Prince with his pampered tenant, she opened the corn bin, and, entering the loose box, offered the cob a handful of crushed oats. And when she stood by the door, Quemlo looked through the grill of the door at his picture, which was tested a beast tamer in the cage. He was aware of her beauty, and the beauty of the animal, as he curved his neck to her jewelled hand and of the ravishing effect of an elegant woman seen in a stable. She smiled proudly, and yet sadly, at Quemlow, who was pulling his heavy moustache. And they could hear an ungoverned burst of Millie's light laughter from the drawing-room, and presently Millie resumed her interrupted song. Opposite the outer door of the stable was the window of the kitchen, whence it issued, like an undertone of the song, a subdued rattle of cups and saucers and the glow of the kitchen fire could be distinguished. And over all this complex domestic organism, attractive and efficient in its every manifestation, vigorously alive now in the smooth calm of the English Sunday, she was queen, and hers was the brain that ruled it while feigning an aloof quiescence. He's a romantic man, he understands all that, she felt with the certainty of intuition. Loud, she said, he must fasten up the dog. When they returned to the drawing-room, there was no sign of John. 
Hasn't your father come in? She asked Ethel in a low voice. Lily was still singing. No, mother, I thought he was with you in the garden. The girl seemed to respond to Leonora's inquietude. Lily finished her song, and Tremlow, who had stationed himself behind her to look at the music, nodded an austere approval. You have an excellent voice, he remarked, and you can use it. To Leonora, this judgment seemed weighty and decisive. Mr. Tremlow, said the girl, smiling with satisfaction, excuse me asking, are you married? No, he answered, are you? Mr. Tremlow, she giggled and turned to Ethel, who in anticipation blushed once again. Eh, I told you. You girls are very curious, Leonora said perfunctorily. Bessie came in and set a Moorish stool here before the Chesterfield. On the stool, an inlaid Sheraton tray with china and a copper kettle droning over a lamp, and near it, a cake stand in three stories. And Leonora, manoeuvring her bangles, commenced the ritual of perfection with Harry as acolyte. He doesn't come, well, he doesn't come, she thought of her husband, and she smiled interrogatively at Arthur Tremlow, holding a lump of sugar aloft in the tongs. Reverend Simon Crane asked who you were at dinner today, said Harry. During the absence of Leonora and her guest, Harry had evidently acquired information concerning Arthur. Oh, Mr. Tremlow, said he appealed quickly, do tell Harry and Ethel what Dr. Talmage said to you. I think it's so funny. I can't do the accent. Oh, what accent? he laughed. She hesitated to talk. Yours, she replied boldly. Very amusing, Harry said judicially after the episode of the Brooklyn collection had been related. Talmage must be a caution. I suppose you're staying at the Five Towns Hotel? he inquired, with an implication in his voice that there was no other hotel in the district fit for the patronage of a man of the world. Tremlow nodded. What a night? Leonor exclaimed. Then where did you dine today? I had dinner at the Tiger. Not a bad dinner either, he said. Oh dear, Harry murmured indicating an august sympathy for Arthur Tremlow in affliction. If I'd only known, I don't know what I was thinking of not to ask you to come here for dinner, said Leonora. I made sure you would be engaged somewhere. Had to you eat all alone at the Tiger on Sunday too, remarked Billy. Tut, tut, Tremlow protested with a farcical exactness of pronunciation, and therefore laughed. What are you laughing at, my dear? Leonora asked mildly. I don't know, Mother, really I don't. Whereupon they all laughed together, and a state of absolute intimacy was established. I hadn't the least notion of being a parasol today, Tremlow explained, but I thought that the night wasn't much of a place. I was did think that, being a native of Parsley. I wouldn't be surprised if you noticed, Mrs. Stanway, how all the five five towns kind of sit and sniff at each other. Well, I felt dull after breakfast, and when I saw the advertisement of Dr. Crane at the old chapel, I came right away. And that's all, except that I'm going to sup with a man at night tonight. There were sounds in the hall. The door of the drawing room opened, but it was only Bessie coming to light the gas. Is that your master just come in? Leonora asked her. Yes, ma'am. At last, said Leonora, and they waited. By this position, Bessie lit the gas, made the fire, the curtains, and departed. Then they could hear John's heavy footsteps overhead. Leonora began nervously to talk about Rose, and Tremlow showed a polite interest in Rose's private trials. Ethel said that she had just visited the patient who slept. Harry asseverated that to remain a moment longer away from his mother's house would mean utter ruin for him. And with extraordinary suddenness, he made his adieu went, followed to the front door by Millicent. The conversation in the room dwindled to disconnected remarks, and was kept alive by a series of separate little efforts. Footsteps were no longer audible overhead. The clock on the mantelpiece struck five, emphasising a silence, and amid growing constraint several minutes passed. Leonora wanted to suggest that John, having lost the dog, must have been delayed by looking for him. She felt that she could not infuse sufficient conviction into the remark, and so said nothing. A thousand fears and misgivings took possession of her, and, not for the first time, she 
He seemed to discern in the gloom of the future some great catastrophe which would swallow up all that was precious to her. At length, John came in, hurried, fidgety, nervous, and Ethel slipped out of the room. Ah, Tremblay, he broke forth. How do you do? How do you do? Glad to see you. You haven't given me up, had you? How do you do? Not quite, said Tremblay gravely as they shook hands. Leonora took the water jug from the tray and went to a chrysanthemum in the farthest corner of the room, where she remained listening and pretending to be busy with the plant. The men talked freely and rapidly with the most careful politeness, and it seemed to her that Tremlow was annoyed, while Stanway was determined to offer no explanation of his absence from tea. Once, in a pause, John turned to Leonora and said that he'd been upstairs to see Rose. Leonora was surprised at the change in Twemlow's demeanour. It was as though the pair were fighting a duel, and Twemlow wore a coat of mail. And these two have not seen each other for twenty-five years, she thought. And they talk like this. She knew then that something lay between them. She could tell from the peculiar well-known look in her husband's eye. When she summoned a decision to approach them where they stood side by side on the hearth rug, both tall, big, Formal and preoccupied. Tremolo at once said that unfortunately he must go. Samway made none but the merest perfunctory attempts to detain him. She thanked Leonora stiffly for her hospitality and said goodbye with scarcely a smile. But as John opened the door for him to pass out, he turned and glanced at her, and smiled brightly, kindly, bowing a final adieu to which she responded. She, who never in her life till then had condescended to such a device, softly stepped to the unlatched door and listened. This one yours, she heard John say, and then the sound of a hat bouncing on the tiled floor. Not my fault entirely, said Twinlow's voice. And by the way, I guess I can see you at the office one day soon. Yes, certainly, John answered with coarse, glib politeness. What about um, some business? Ah, oh, yes. Business, called Twemlow. They walked away towards the outer hall, and she heard no more, except the indistinct murmur of a sudden brief dialogue between the visitor and the two girls, who must have come in from the garden. Then the front door banged heavily. She was gone. The vast and arid tedium of her life closed in upon her again. She seemed to exist in a colourless void, peopled only by ominous, dim, elusive shapes of disaster. But as involuntarily she clenched her hands, a formidable thought swept through her brain that Arthur Twemlow was not so calm, nor so impassive, nor so set apart, but that her spell over him, if she chose to exert it, might be a shield to the devious man, her husband. End of chapter 3